Hello and welcome to this review of my Leading Edge 8815K. I've been looking forward to showing you one of these for a long time as it uses a type of switch that's extremely rare and unusual. The only other example I know of it is an NCR keyboard that XMIT restored a long time ago. But then this Leading Edge model showed up on Desk Authority, new old stock even, and I offered to buy it. That said, after a lot of digging, this board turned out to have a ton of history behind it. Leading Edge Hardware Products were an American company most well known in the community for the DC2014 keyboard, which is a common target for Blue Alps harvesting. Hopefully I'll get one of those someday to review as well, as that's also a pretty interesting keyboard. The 8815K appears to be the keyboard that came with the very first computer Leading Edge ever made, the ironically named Model M after Mitsubishi who supplied their parts. This computer was released in late 1982 for $2000 originally, but it wasn't a huge success, and what few pictures I could find of it, which are in service manuals, actually show it with the keyboard of its later brother, the 1985 Model D computer, named after Daewoo who supplied the parts at that time, and who contracted Alps to make the now well-known DC2014 keyboard for it. That said, when Leading Edge couldn't supply the Mitsubishi dealers with their hardware, they sued, and Leading Edge went bankrupt and was subsequently acquired by Daewoo as early as 1989, despite the huge success of the Model D computer. That said, the 8815K itself, or actually the Model M keyboard as it should be known, is much more of an enigma. I can't find anything about the keyboard, or even any picture of another one. So far, it appears to be a unicorn. The back label shows the FCC ID, which is linked to an American company from Norcross Jaoja called Keytech Inc., of which the 8815K appears to be the only thing they filed FCC IDs for. Keytech was either dissolved or incorporated as early as 1983, and the FCC ID for the keyboard was transferred to Leading Edge's own DHX code shortly after, so maybe Keytech were acquired by them. Regardless, Keytech are also a dead end. The only thing I have to go on are the switches, which are a bit of a mystery themselves. The switches on this leading edge appear to be almost identical to the ones on XMIT's NCR board, but there are subtle differences. For example, the NCR is MX mount, while the leading edge is not, and this board has a small cutout in the bottom lip of the switches, while the NCR doesn't. They also have different manufacturers. The NCR was made by Oak Industries and ADI, while the leading edge was made by Keytech alone, it seems. Oak Industries was part of a mining and smelting conglomerate named Oak Mitsui, and they were a major supplier of ultra-thin copper tracers, so they likely supplied just a PCB. ADI, on the other hand, were a keyboard manufacturer, so I think it's likely that they made the switches, assembly, and possibly the case as well. The ADI switches appear to be clones of this Keytech version, or the other way around. This one is from 1983, and although I don't know what year the NCR was built, that one uses a 101 key layout and it's MX compatible, so I'm pretty sure it's younger than the leading edge. That's little to go on for a definitive conclusion, I know, but for the moment at least, I'd say it's plausible that the Keytech switches are the older of the two. Regardless, these inductive switches are a very interesting design. Although the switch tops may not look very exotic, if you take a look at the PCB, you'll quickly realize there's some strange shit going on here. The biggest giveaway are these circular holes in the PCB with circular tracers going around the edges, which are typical for inductive switches. It has these circular tracers on both sides of the PCB, except on one side it's just the columns, and on the other side it's just rows. Inductive switches are closely related to magnetic valve switches, which by themselves are one of the most esoteric designs I know of. But instead of using a magnet to regulate electron flow, it uses only induction by way of this little ferrite bead riveted to the slider here. Ferrite is a type of composite material with iron filings, which means it can be easily magnetized. It's often found on cables of all sorts of electronic devices, including keyboards, and acts as a low-pass frequency filter to prevent electromagnetic interference to and from other devices. However, it can also be used to carry a magnetic field, so to speak. As the keyboard scans for key presses, it sends a pulse down the column tracers, which, as we saw earlier, are shaped like a loop. Recall that electricity going around in a loop generates a magnetic field. 
When the user presses a key down far enough, the ferret bead comes down through the hole, and at some point the column traces will be inductively coupled to the row traces on the other side through the magnetization of the ferret bead. All it has to do then on the row side is listen for a current. Now because the current induced into the rows is very weak, it first has to be amplified because otherwise it's simply too small to work with. So every row has this little toroidal core, which is basically a very simple transformer with one loop going in and about 20 coming out. So it amplifies the outgoing voltage by a factor of roughly 20. Furthermore, the voltage is dependent on how far the ferrite bead is down the hole, so you need something to transform the analog output signal into a digital, pressed or not signal that the computer can work with. This is accomplished by something called a Schmidt trigger, and in this case I think it's this little thing here. They stay completely off until a certain level of current, at which point they switch completely on, and they revert back again when they go below another point. These components have built-in hysteresis, although from my testing of this board, I found the hysteresis to be very small. In any case, it's a very interesting switch design, quite unique. Although inductive switches are common in other applications, they seem to be extremely rare on keyboards. The switches themselves are actually very simple, it's just a magnet riveted to a slider, a coil spring and a single part top housing that clips into a mounting plate, so just four parts in total. As they are electromagnetic in origin, rather than conductive, these switches should be extremely reliable, presumably a hundred million cycles or possibly well above that. Also, they have inherent N-key rollover, which is nice of course. And furthermore, because they're contactless, they have the potential to be very smooth. Well, actually, that's kind of where it falls short, because, to be honest, the switches, which are rather stiff linears, are not smooth at all. They bind really badly, and they feel scratchy. As a matter of fact, so much so that I fairly regularly miss key presses on it. Now, keep in mind that this thing is new old stock and absolutely spotlessly clean, so this is probably as good as it's going to get. Although I used it for a week, I can't say I enjoyed it a lot. The key feels pretty horrible, which is a shame for such an interesting keyboard. The actuation also happens rather far down, and because there's so little hysteresis, I found that it's fairly easy to accidentally let go of a key you're trying to keep depressed. Let me give you a concrete example of that. In Rainbow Six Siege, reinforcing a wall requires you to hold down a key, in this case F, for a few seconds while the animation completes. But upon looking into it further, I found that what I actually do when depressing keys is that I first press them down all the way, like this, and then relax the press a little bit because it gets really fatiguing to keep it jammed down all the way. But because of the low actuation point and very short hysteresis, doing this tends to interrupt the animation very frequently which is an example of why having hysteresis in a key switch is actually a desirable thing from a design perspective. Now onto the keyboard interface, it uses the XT protocol with an old 5-pin DIN plug on its somewhat thick cable, and unlike the DC2014, it was easy to convert using a Sora's, just plug it in and it works. Now the plug has a curiously long grounding shield on it, but it's otherwise pretty standard. It also uses an XT layout identical to that of the IBM model FXT actually. Now, the later DC2014 was also an XT class board, but it used a slightly different, updated layout. The XT layout is rather antiquated, and playing games with it is a bit hard when you're expecting the control key to be here, when it's actually where caps lock normally goes, but in all fairness I know many people like it there. Overall, it takes some getting used to, but it's not that bad, really. If you use it as a daily driver, you get over it pretty quickly. One thing that might be a bit odd to some people is the stepped keycaps, and in fact, the DC2014 didn't have them anymore, but these kind of caps were not uncommon on XT-era keyboards. They tended to step keys like this to prevent people from pressing them on the edges, which would make them bind very badly. It's basically a cheaper but inferior alternative to using stabilizers. And that brings us to the keycaps, which are made out of medium-thick PBT, and they're dice up, so they're really durable, and they still look great. However, even though it uses a cross-mount, it's not MX-compatible, so you can't use them on a modern keyboard. This is a common thing with vintage cross-mounts. MX-mount was nowhere near as popular back in the 80s as it is nowadays, particularly in 1983, when MX hadn't even been invented yet. As for the build quality, it's not bad actually. It weighs a solid 1.6 kilograms and it feels nice and dense. It barely flexes at all too.
It comes with Model FXT style flip out feet using knobs on the side that you can turn to extend them. It's pretty cool, although they turn rather stiffly. And finally, I just think it looks pretty good, you know, with that cool looking leading edge logo in the top left and a nice stylish classy case and design, it has something very elegant to it. Nice. Overall, it's an extremely interesting vintage relic with some mystery and history behind it, and really cool switches, and it's easily convertible too, but still, I'd say it's not very nice to use at all. Sure, it's got inherent N-key rollover, and the layout is not that bad when you get used to it, but they just bind so badly, and they're unreliable enough at registering properly that using it is more annoying than rewarding, and it's quite stiff to boot. But, as a collector's item, I love it. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.